Hi, my name is Phil. I like talking about politics. And in this video, I want to explore the notion that Boris Johnson and the Conservatives are actually making a right dog's dinner of the general election campaign so far in its early stages. And it's a general election that they desperately wanted. Boris Johnson was whinging and whining for so long about it. And they finally won it and won it on their own terms. So why are they making such an arse of it? But first, if you'd like to receive notifications of my upload, then please click the subscribe button and the bell notification icon next to it as well. So over the last day or two, I've been reading and, and listening to various commentators and journalists mulling over the notion that Conservatives have been making such a hash of the general election campaign that it's almost like they're sabotaging their own prospects of winning a majority. In fact, they've made so many bad errors that I've seen some people even suggesting that they're trying to lose the general election just to finally get out of the responsibility of Brexit altogether. But then we have to remind ourselves of the saying, never ascribe to malice that which may be explained by incompetence. And we do need to remember that Boris Johnson is incompetent. I don't just say that as a political opponent. He's shown time and time again to be politically inept. He's not able to judge a situation. He's also packed out senior positions in his cabinet based not on ability or experience, because precious few of them have got any experience at all, but on their commitment to a hard Brexit. So that means almost all senior members of the government are not only political bumblers, but they haven't got the tools or the skills necessary to really campaign at this level. Only Sajid Javid and Michael Gove, of all the senior ministers, have any decent level of ministerial experience. But with the election campaign underway, the sheer number of cock-ups is quite breathtaking and maybe just set to increase. So starting off with Jacob Rees-Mogg's crass comment from a couple of days ago first, quite quickly, because I did a whole video on it on Tuesday, if you want to check that out, but he made a dreadful statement blaming the victims of Grenfell. Now, this was bad enough in itself, but the sort of thing that these sorts of people are going to come out with now and then, it's to be expected. Now, where I personally think there might be some credence in suggesting that it's deliberate is what happened later. So Rhys Mogg made a fake apology. There was a huge backlash. He made his fake apology, the sort that didn't even retract his earlier statement. They usually at least do that. Now, the sort of, this sort of thing is common. You say a thing or you do a thing, there's a backlash, and then you go on, you do your, your apology. And it's, it's never a, a real one. So the way it works is that an out-of-touch MP makes this inadvisable statement. It does happen regularly, not as bad as this. And then the party PR machine spits out its coffee all over their television screens and immediately gets on the phone. They explain to the minister exactly what they did wrong and advise them on exactly what to say to rectify the situation, or at least limit the damage. Now, if Rhys Mogg's comment was seen as something that needed rectifying, they would absolutely have given him a statement to apologize with that would have changed the whole meaning of his statement, throwing doubt on his original intention. The fact that this did not happen and that he essentially doubled down on the blame is an indication that it was deliberate. So what else have they done? Well, the issue of the candidate for Gower who said that poor people should be put down. Now, we can't exactly say this is evidence for wanting to lose the election because it was a classic case of something that the candidate in question said years ago that's been dragged up now that we're gearing up for an election campaign. However, the party have not replaced her with a cleaner candidate. But again, I wouldn't say it was evidence of throwing an election as such. Even the local party is supporting her, so there's no conspiracy. As with the Reese Moore comment, I just see it as part of a campaign to present themselves as a hardline party in a very polarised society in order to avoid shedding votes to the Brexit party. Some people have even suggested it's a dead cat. I'm not so sure of, but I can see the logic in it because, you know, they want to cover up the idea uh, that they're sitting on evidence of Russian interference in the Conservative Party. So they do something else to, to give the media something to talk about. That's possible. Though, as I've said before on more than one occasion, I'd be surprised if they have anything to worry about in terms of trying to get those hardline voters on their side. Farage aside, the people behind the Brexit party do genuinely want Brexit. And I cannot believe that they would oppose the Conservatives as that would only help other parties to win the elections. And then what does that do for their Brexit ambitions? The next example cited was Alan Cairns. He's a cabinet member who has supported an aid 
believed to have been involved in the sabotage of a rape trial. Cairns has now resigned as a minister on the same day that Parliament's dissolving anyway, but that presumably means he won't get into the cabinet if Johnson wins a majority anyway after the election. But again, he is still intending to stand as the candidate for the party. And again, it's got a lot of bad press. Conservative Party HQ also released an edited version of a Sakir Starmer uh, video in order to spread fake news about a senior Labour MP. Again, coming for a lot of criticism on this. You've then got the Chancellor being berated by the Cabinet Office for attempting to use civil servants, which are supposed to be used for government, government business, not party political business, using civil servants to try and discredit Labour policies by coming up with costings of them, but not producing costings of their own policies to compare. You know the usual thing. They say, oh, it's going to cost this amount. And any sort of government spending always sounds like a lot to an ordinary person, but they're not doing costings of their own stuff to compare it to. The aim, of course, being to push their usual narrative of, oh, the country can't afford Labour policies, which often works, despite the fact that actually Labour promote growth and the Conservatives only show economic stagnation. The data proves that. But people don't look at data. But the key thing is it was an abuse as it's using public officials for party political purposes. They should use their own staff for that. Besides, I don't even know why they wanted to use the civil service for this. It's not like they needed the policies costing by someone competent. They lie about their own figures. Why not just make up a figure concerning Labour's plans? They usually do. Labour's policies are going to cost one bajillion pounds. That is the sort of level they're usually at. And of all these things being attacked in the media, you know, at least parts of the media that are not fully behind the Conservatives. So the news is getting there. This sort of news is getting to a lot of people. It is actually being reported on. Apparently yesterday, even uh, James Cleverly, who is the Conservative Party chairman, he's not a bright chap despite his name, was even torn a new arsehole by Piers Morgan, who is a, a very much uh, a very right wing fauna, um, because the situation was so ridiculous. It was so indefensible. So it's not even like there's any effective cover ups going on over this. And it certainly doesn't look good to the bulk of more moderate voters and so you could definitely see it as a bad start to the campaign. Robert Peston, who, who commentates for the ITV, he did actually make an interesting point about their attacks on Jeremy Corbyn, however. So in a general election campaign, you do expect the two major parties to attack each other's leaders. Of course you do. The party leader plays an important part in many people's voting decisions, and the Conservatives are currently onto a winner with Corbyn already being so unpopular in the country. But he noted that they tried to demonise him in 2000, 2017 general election and all it did was just raise his standing amongst his supporters. Classic case of rallying around the flag, which did so well for George W. Bush in getting re-elected as president of the US. That being said, I wouldn't say it was necessarily an unsuitable ploy on that basis because Corbyn's supporters would vote Labour anyway. Johnson certainly isn't trying to attract their votes. It, if it can just hit home for other voters, then I suppose they think it's worth it. And maybe it is. I also noticed that both Labour and the Conservatives are playing a sort of tug of war with the Liberal Democrats. Labour noting that the Liberal Democrats um, lean towards the right and are more likely to support the Conservatives if they become kingmakers. And the Conservatives saying that a vote for Liberal Democrats is a vote for Corbyn as Prime Minister. An attempt, I'm sure to try and sneak back some of the votes he's clearly losing on the centre-right because as he pushes more and more to the hard right, of course he's going to be losing um, support on the centre-right, which has been vacuumed up by the Liberal Democrats, but his focus is on the Brexit party. Labour, on the other hand, have had, they've had one bad PR moment, but it didn't involve uh, anyone senior in the Labour Party, so it hasn't really spread nationally when a Labour Party candidate said something pretty terrible, not on Jacob Rees-Mogg's thing, talking about delighting in the deaths of certain people like Tony Blair. But that hasn't hit the national news. Um, so the main campaign, I would say, has been focused by comparison. And it might actually be interesting to come back to this topic in a week and see how things are shaping up. So in 2017, Labour didn't run a good campaign. Of course they didn't, they lost uh, by definition, but it was solid. You know, there weren't cock-ups. They didn't make any cock-ups. People were on message. If they'd managed to improve on that performance at all, and the senior Conservative campaigners keep arsing things up, 
we might end up with a rather happier December the 13th, and uh, which is the day, by the way, that the election results will become apparent, than might otherwise have been feared, certainly by me. Or perhaps the Conservative campaigning machine will rumble into action and keep a tight rein on the various MPs that have been making these political boo-boos. What they really need to do is have political minders for all the idiots in Cabinet, and there's quite a lot of them, and tell them exactly what to say and tell them not to go off piste at all. Very much what they did with Boris Johnson. Now, Boris Johnson, while he was Mayor of London, didn't make a whole series of cock-ups. Like, functionally, he did. Everything he did was a disaster. But in terms of how he came across to the public, they actually got him sounding sensible and serious. They maybe need to get those sort of people on that. Um, I mean, obviously, I hope they don't, but from their point of view. Uh, so, you know, what they're going to need minders, at least for Boris Johnson, Jacob Rees-Mogg, Priti Patel, Dominic Raab, James Cleverley, at the least, all the Tories who are going to play a major role in the campaign. They're all politically inept. And if they don't have those minders carefully controlling everything they say and do on the campaign. All to the good, people like me, opponents of the Conservatives for this election. So I hope you found the video interesting. Please click the like button if you did. And if you'd like to support the channel further, then please click the Patreon link for details. And until next time, I'll see you later.